This is the Jeff Santos Show on the Revolution Radio Network. Rebuilding America together. Now, here's Jeff. It's the Jeff Santos Show that you are tuned into. We are here every Monday through Friday, 3 to 6 Eastern, 12 to 3 Pacific time, where our next guest is uh, uh, in that time zone. And, of course, you can uh, check us out on uh, tape delay on the uh, great uh, 92.7 FM, 7 to 10 Central Time there in Madison, Wisconsin, again on 92.7 FM. Check us out also on RevolutionRadioNetwork.com. We are streaming audio around the clock up until Monday at 3 o'clock Eastern. When we come back live, you can check out all the great guests we've had today, Alan Grayson, John Nichols, uh, our good friend uh, Joe Sandberg, uh, Alan Minsky, and our next guest. He is, of course, the Renaissance Man of the Jeff Santo Show. He's a great musician. Check his uh, website out on YouTube as well. Uh, Mark Taylor Canfield joins us from the 206 there in Seattle, WA. Mr. Mark, how are you, sir? Well, I'm not on the water this time, but it is a beautiful day in Seattle, so I might be out there soon. Excellent. Um, but no, it, we've been, you know, doing um, coverage of a breaking story here in Seattle, which I know you want to talk about at some point. But yes, also, yes. it's been the the Occupy Wall Street uh, anniversary, the tenants tenth anniversary. So we've been doing a lot of work on, on that on Democracy Watch News and talking about things like, you know, me getting my picture taken and published in the Washington Post when I was burning my Bank of America card here in Seattle and the major civil rights lawsuit that I won against the Washington State Patrol when they arrested me as a journalist while covering some of those occupations in the state capitol buildings. And and in that case, it was Olympia, Washington, so the state capitol here in Washington State. But, uh, yeah, you know, things never seem to slow down for a journalist. And then I've got you know, the band I'm working on and doing a couple books. And I will be writing um, an article for Truth Out and the Seattle Star about my experiences at the Occupy Wall Street movement events that took place here in Seattle and across the country. And as I keep pointing out, actually, there were things that were happening here long before uh, people started gathering in Zuccotti Park in New York City because there was a six-day uh, sit-in protest at the Washington State Capitol against budget cuts and in solidarity with the folks in Wisconsin who were sitting in at their governor's office in their state capitol so that kind of activity and that movement started uh, way before zuccotti park and carries on to this day i think with you know candidates like our democratic socialist uh city council member shama swan uh, my friend and congresswoman camilla jayapal the bernie sanders campaign for president is still we see the same populist progressive values out here you know uh, on the political spectrum being pushed by these groups and I think we'll see, you know, these movements come again. It seems to be a cycle. We had them here in Washington during the Seattle demonstrations in 1989. Uh, we saw them again during the Iraq War and um, during the Occupy Wall Street movement. And then Black Lives Matter movement last year was incredibly active uh, in this city. And, you know, the city was filled with tear gas uh, last year this time. Jeff, that's what we were doing. We were actually out on the streets last year this time, still breathing the tear gas, you know, wondering if the police department was ever going to be reformed or not. And some of us are still wondering that this day. Well, let me ask you, I think you mentioned one thing that was really, really uh, fascinating for me, and, and that is the, the issue, uh, which I think is, is critical here, um, is the whole concept of going against corporate America. And, and again, if you go back to Seattle, which you started your reporting career, uh, and what we're, we're doing there, that that to me is is a perfect example um, of you know getting people organized to stop the power, the monopolies, and that that to me is is a real big, uh, real big concern. Um, do, do people in in, in Seattle um, understand that? Not not only did to celebrate the anniversary, but we're going to have to continue this sort of activism. Because I was, I was saying uh, to some folks earlier that you know, you're going to be calling 202-224-3121 or, or call the White House number as well. And I think it is, is the importance of Seattle in leading not only back with the Occupy, as you talked about last week, uh, that it was there before it was in Zuccotti Park. And I, I think you guys are at a, at a, at a, at a really um, important place 
in American history in the 21st century uh, to, to sort of lead um, a progressive movement. We all know how Bernie won overwhelmingly there in 16 and, and so forth. And I think that if you can activate that, uh, that progressive base that's there, I think it goes a long, long way. I mean, people like Jayapal are showing, I think I, she's had brilliant, brilliant interviews over the last week and a half. I've seen her on television. That, to me, is an example of what, what you guys have produced. She is one of the most activist members of Congress I've ever seen. I, I don't know if I've ever seen one, you know, and she replaced Jim McDermott after he retired, mm-hmm. and he was, you know, way out there on the progressive uh, ledge, so to speak, too. So, uh, no, she's a fighter. She said that she was a progressive fighter, and that was the reputation that she developed when Bernie Sanders came along to endorse her. Now he's endorsed uh, our Lorena Gonzalez, our city council president for mayor here. He's also... um endorsed Teresa Mesqueda, who is a city council member with pretty good progressive credentials. Um, and now we have a new person who won uh, her part of the primary, and that's Nikita Oliver, who is way out there on the left, so uh, uh, a member of the People's Party, and she is definitely you know, uh, not being controlled by the conservative corporate interests in Seattle. So we'll see where that comes down. I know how they've dealt with Shama Sawant, the Democratic Socialist. They've been trying to launch a recall campaign against her to get her to have to uh, face a recall in November. Um, so th- I wouldn't doubt it, Jeff, if you see the same thing happening with somebody like Nikita Oliver, because she will definitely go after the sacred cows in Seattle and the corporate monopoly here. Um, you can bet uh, she will be another fire fiery fighter on the city council. And, you know, regardless of what happens with the mayor's office, you know, we could also end up with Bruce Harrell, a more centrist candidate. But I think uh, the city council is only getting more and more progressive. And despite, you know, whatever uh, criticisms they get from the business interests for, you know, being a uh, socialist or being a nanny uh, city or whatever it is, I mean, they've been able to accomplish quite a bit uh, with city ordinances in ways that other city councils don't seem to address. Um, but, you know, same issue, though. You know, I heard the, the last segment in the caller um, and what was happening in Los Angeles, I still don't see the uh, affordable housing problem being solved here. Although I, I have noticed that there is a, a low income housing institute here that has acquired, I think, two or three more buildings, and I think a couple of them are on Capitol Hill. So that's a start. That's a good start. If you can create more affordable housing projects, and I'm not talking about the huge, you know, multi block, uh, you know, monstrosities that they built in Chicago, I'm talking about older apartment buildings from the maybe the, the brick uh, and mortar kind of structures from back in the 20s and 30s which still are standing around here or you have you know uh, some of the apartment complexes that were built in, during the world's fair they're still st- you know standing and they're they're well constructed buildings and there's no reason why they, they can't be turned into affordable housing so i hope we see more of that i hope there's more funding um, we're seeing it little by little that, you know, there's a little bit more money being um, spent on affordable housing. A few new taxes, uh, they were successful in finally passing a corporate tax here so that uh, uh, Amazon has to pay at least part of its fair share. And so that was a, uh, a good inroad into what, we're, what we should be looking at in Seattle. I think in order to continue to have a livable city, uh, we have no choice but to get some kind of rent control and to to develop a system where there's affordable housing for people, um, we got to start there. And I'm, I would hope that Lorena Gonzalez, she, if she becomes mayor, will be able to do that, but no guarantees. I mean, the last few mayors have also said that they were going to end the um, houseless problem in Seattle, and I don't see that happening. So we'll see what happens. My, my hope is resting actually on Nikita Oliver, that at least, if nothing else, at least she will shake things up a bit and maybe uh, Shama Swant will have another firebrand on the city council um, to to rely on to push some of this legislation because Swant has definitely been the most effective member of the city council and has been behind all of the major uh, campaigns coming out of Seattle, Seattle, including the $15 an hour minimum wage, and now she's really pushing for rent control. So, uh, yeah, more of that. More women of color on the city council who have these progressive causes is a good thing for my city, Jeff. It's looking good. Well, that's fantastic. And, you know, uh, people are excited about it, including our, uh, our regular caller and uh, fantastic, uh, uh, you know, former uh, respiratory therapist and our good friend John, who has uh, a question or comment for you uh, as well. Let's uh, take him 
uh, right now and uh, make sure we can uh, bring him uh, into uh, uh, the discussion. Uh, John, you are next with Mark Taylor Canfield. Go right ahead. Hey, you John. Know, uh, I'll try. Hi. Yeah, I'll try to be brief. Uh, Democracy Watch, uh, that is headquartered in Ottawa, Canada. Is that the same organization that, that you uh, are associated with? They are not our parent organization, although we consider each other allies. Um, so I see. No, I see. Uh, yeah, we are Democracy Watch News. They are more of a public interest group, so we do I straight see. journalism. Yeah. But, uh, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, I love uh, Seattle because I do think that it is the most progressive city in the United States. Uh, I mean, just the history of people that have been on the city council, uh, you know, it, it's just uh, absolutely amazing to see. And I don't know why that is. Is it the fog? Does it just sort of make people calmer <laughs> and they can move on? <laughs> is it the food? Well, the What's fog is also in San Francisco, Seattle? so maybe you got something there, you know, that's yeah, both progressive I, cities. I, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. I yeah, agree with I I don't know what the I'm not sure John what the ingredients are we do have some of the best brews in the world some really good coffee an amazing natural environment with a lot of uh, natural wonders so that probably lends itself we we are actually a lot less foggy than San Francisco to tell you the truth I was talking with my friend yesterday yeah Yeah. they get really you just have more cloud cover than San Francisco though Right. Yeah. Yes. I think it, they get the PC, I think uh, they get the London style yeah. fog. We we don't have as much of that. Yeah. We just get a lot of overcast skies. But then, you know, yeah. sometimes it's also yeah. really sunny and beautiful here too. So yeah. No, I've been. <laughs> yeah, you've been in Seattle at that time too. Yeah, in San Francisco, it it produces almost a despondency, which produces beat poetry and things of this there you sort, go. <laughs> which I never did really understand. <laughs> And, uh, you know, what can I say? I would say that the weather might have something to do with the, the weather here might have something to do with the grunge movement because the the most famous band, Nirvana, those blokes Uh came from Aberdeen and Hokri and they came from a logging town right on Grays Harbor on the Pacific Coast where it is very foggy. It rains all the time there. There is a, a rain convergence there so it could be 85 degrees in seattle if people yeah. are like looking to run to the beach and you get to hoquiam and it's 55 yeah. and rainy and miserable so you turn around and go home well like, i i so yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. yes go ahead john you I, got 10 I'm originally seconds from new york and, and i have to say the food is great in seattle it's even better than new york city um it, uh, it's just wonderful so. i don't know if i would go that far <laughs> I, 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 I don't know if I, I would go that far, John. I really appreciate the compliment. We do have great seafood. Yeah. Well, the um, salmon may be better. I don't know about uh, anything else, though. Uh, New York is no, particularly the pasta. Uh, there is no fresh lobster here because it all has to be brought from eh. the Northeast. However, the Dungeness yeah. crabs are incredible. And I have to tell you that if you come to Seattle right now, what you're going to find is a lot of Asian food because the Pacific oh, yeah. uh, Rim and the yeah. Asian culture is very influential here and in Vancouver. Yep. Yep. So if you are looking yeah. for uh, yeah. noodles, oh, my God, you're, if you're looking for a Vietnamese yeah. food and pho, you're, in the, gr- you're yeah. in the right place because there's so many different kinds of food here that appeal but, to folks from Japan, yeah. China, Southeast Asia. Yeah. yeah, it's, yeah. There you go. That, John, that, thank that, you, my that, friend. That also, that, to talk about the housing issue, that's one of the issues like Airbnb. It comes into a city like yours, like San Francisco, and it just throws all these people out on the street because the mom-and-pop apartments are turned into Airbnbs. That You could address that, too. It's interesting. Yeah, no, John, that's a, that's a great way. Uh, let me let me take that, uh, and thank you for the call, John. Um you know, one of the things, again, I, I think that Seattle is perfectly positioned to lead on, Mark, is on the housing crisis. Because, as you said, you have seen just in your neighborhood along there in Capitol Hill, you know, the, the prices got jacked through the roof. And it was only I remember this and I've said this to you both off the air and on the air. I went to Seattle in the mid 1990s in Capitol Hill uh, and I looked at a place uh, as a small one bedroom condo. I could have paid seventy thousand dollars for a one bedroom condo overlooking Capitol Hill in a beautiful area. Uh, you know, it's changed quite a bit since then, hasn't it? 
you know, I was hanging out with my friend Tom on his houseboat the other day, you know, thinking, wow, how do you afford these these days because they're so expensive? But, you know, he bought that houseboat in the late 70s when it was relatively cheap. And he was a young guy, you know, living in Seattle. And he thought, hey, I'll put some logs out on the dock and I'll build myself a house. And the next thing you know, he has a houseboat. Now, it's a, it's a beautiful place. It's a, a menagerie, you know, a curiosity shop because he's an artist. He's an amazing uh, wood carver and visual artist. So he's actually making sculptures of whales right now. He's really crazy about whales. But you go out to his place and he's sitting there out on his porch and you look around with all these expensive houses and some of those houseboats are sort of palatial and they're sitting next to, you know, uh, huge yachts, including, I think, you know, the owner of the, the Red Sox still has his yacht out here. So, uh, I asked him, how did you do it? He said, in 19, you know, 70 whatever, it cost him, uh, it was a $500 down payment. Best investment he ever made in his life, right? Now he's traveled around the world in many places, but he has that home base in Seattle where he lives right on the water and he's sitting out there the other day on his dock carving, you know, uh, a wooden, wooden uh, sculpture of a whale. And I pull up in my kayak and he's like, hey, jump on jump on up mark let's hang out that's his lifestyle people come by in their boats and kayaks and visit with him or say hi to him that's that's nice but he's lucky because he made that purchase a long time ago my, my parents bought their home for a very inexpensive price and then later it was worth you know uh hundreds of thousands of dollars so that used to be a great investment for middle class and, and working folks a uh, way to build wealth now not so much in seattle the cost of housing is way out of the the middle class uh, realm, yeah, um, it's it's uh, all it's all for realm. the it's all for the uh, as as John said, it's for the uh, investors coming from uh, from Asia or coming from uh, Europe, and they they go in and they they uh, they buy the buy the apartments from the Airbnbs uh, and so forth, and and this is what ends up happening. You have a lot of empty peop- empty houses, and you don't know who's going in there at three o'clock in the morning. We had that when I was running for office in Cambridge three years ago, and uh, you know it was, it was a big big issue. And yeah, and you that can't afford it. The, yeah. That ties into the strike that's happening here, which is a breaking national news story. There are 2,000 uh, Northwest Carpenters Union construction workers on strike right now, and one of their major arguments is that they cannot afford to live in the city where they work. So we have all these issues that we're dealing with that other major cities are dealing with too, and Seattle's such a boom or bust situation now it looks like we're getting rid of a lot of single family housing here which is really a shame because one of the things that really has made seattle a nice place to live is the residential areas within the city so you know it, things are changing uh, as the bob dylan song said but maybe not in such a great direction there they're expecting a huge influx of people into the city but i'm telling you you know if the real estate prices are so high that people can't afford to buy a home or rent here good luck you know and so I think what you have is a lot of multinational corporations uh, seeing right now includes Google, Facebook, Amazon, some of the biggest names in the corporate world. And uh, I think their attitude about all of this is you just buy a property and you sit on it. And if you're a multi-billion dollar company, you can afford to do that. You can wait for the, bu- for the boom to come and you sit it out during the bust. That's what Paul Allen did in South Lake Union in Seattle when he just bought up all the old warehouses that weren't being used anymore because... All of the shipping and everything moved off of the lake and went down into uh, onto Elliott Bay at the piers. And he sat on that property and you know and charged people cheap rent. And artists, you know, hung out down here and we had these great shows. And then one day when the dot com boom happened, that started it. Then there was a dot com bust and people were selling their things on the street again. <laughs> and now we're back to another gold rush, uh, which started with IT and also includes biomed and some other research facilities here. So you have major corporations that can afford to just buy out entire neighborhoods and then sit on the property. And a lot of these buildings and these towers that they're building all over downtown Seattle right now, the skyline is completely changing once again, day by day. Um, a lot of those towers are not even open yet. They're not, uh, there's, they're not um, occupied. There are two major Google buildings down on Lake Union that have been built for two years. One of them involved a serious crane accident where some people were killed. And unfortunately, I was a few blocks away when that happened but wow. there were um there are buildings that aren't open yet and they can afford to sit on these buildings small businesses can't do that they get priced out of uh the city um even small chains like the guitar center you know where i used to get a lot of guitars the biggest guitar center north of 
uh, Los Angeles, you know, with a $3 million inventory got pushed aside by Google because they are such a behemoth that, you know, a national chain like the Guitar Center is like a, f- a flea to them. <laughs> you know, it's like a, a mosquito. They just swat at it and it goes away. So, you know, that's where we're at. Um, I'm hoping that um, the, the strike, which, you know, is an interesting situation because you have uh, rank-and-file organizers like Arthur Esparza. Now, Democracy Watch News was way out ahead on the story because I had already interviewed Arthur twice um, they were always holding rallies down at the Associated General Contractors of Washington State Headquarters in Seattle, which is actually built out on the water. And so I would kayak or boat by there all the time with my friends or on, on my own and see them. And finally, I just started interviewing them and going to the rallies and taking photographs and filming them. And the next thing you know, we have him on our podcast for a two-part series. And I predicted that there was going to be a strike so i'm getting pretty good uh, i guess you know uh, <laughs> predicting the, the social and economic and political um uh future for seattle i knew there was going to be a strike i also i just knew that arthur as a, a union member of the c uh the carpenters union uh the northwest carpenters union that he couldn't publicly say that you know that he couldn't publicly call yeah. for a strike without well you know that's that's why I, that's why I have. think that again you guys are in in a perfect position, Mark, uh, to sort of lead on housing, on on uh, on more, uh, you know, the ability for people to, to collectively organize. Uh, and these are all critical things. But unfortunately, what I find here as being a a person who's lived in all four northeastern big cities: Boston, New York, uh, Philadelphia, and D.C. Although Philadelphia, for a very short time. I find that uh, there, there's always, you know, this sort of right wing backlash that people get scared of, and particularly in Washington, where it's, you know, it's it's being paid for by all of corporate America writ large, and and that that's not what I think you guys get in Seattle, and to a lesser extent, you're you're a little sister, a little brother city in Portland, um, even though they wouldn't like to to hear that, but you know, th- those are two cities that you know I think are, are very progressive, and and will, along with Washington State and Oregon. I mean, I mean that's that's if you if you think about it, that's the Cascadia. You can you know chop off a, a, a part of California that includes uh, San Francisco as well. But that's that's where it is in America. And you know I mean yeah there are parts of Boston and parts of uh, New York City and Minneapolis and uh, you know Madison. But for the most part that's where it's at. And I, I just hope that you guys can continue to lead, continue to produce people like Jayapal. I mean I was surprised to see Patty Murray as part of the uh, group of 10 on the Senate side of progressives. You know, that was a shocking thing. Uh, but maybe, you know, Bernie has worked on her and the leadership. And, you know, I mean, she at one point when she ran, I remember being out in, in, in California or in Seattle in 1994, you know, and she was, you know, the woman in sneakers or whatever the heck her, her saying was. And she got elected there. Uh, in that uh, in that year of the woman, I believe, or maybe it was ninety two that she got elected. But um, yeah, so they, there you go. I I think that the soccer mom, yeah, soccer yeah, mom, soccer and, mom in, in tennis shoes, and and then Maria Cantwell was also elected a senator. We still have two female senators. Uh, it was interesting seeing Patty Murray move on some of that. We saw Maria Cantwell do a lot of great stuff on net neutrality, but they sent, tend to pick and choose, and then yeah. they came to the Iraq. Yeah, they, that's that's exactly the case. But you know, in the case of uh, yeah. of Mari, she's in leadership. Hey, man, we got to run, but uh, yeah. I know that you're playing a lot of music and so forth. Uh, people can go to YouTube, right? Yes, you can go to YouTube, SoundCloud, Instagram, and Facebook, and follow me. And if you want to follow my journalism, it's, there's a lot on Twitter. And yeah, I'll continue to uh, follow this story in Seattle where 2,000 construction workers are currently on strike. Uh, the, the climate pledge uh, arena is still under construction because they have a no strike contract and some of the sound transit um, stuff is still happening. But a lot of these major uh, corporate developments that I was speaking of are now shut down for the time being. So rock on, Jeff. Good to talk to you. Hey, good, good to talk to you, man. Be safe out there. Uh, thank you. We'll talk to you next Friday. All the best. You too. I want to thank Ron Carter for producing this broadcast. Uh, I want to thank you all for calling in and listening. Uh, we have the best uh, callers, best listeners in the country, bar none. Folks, have yourself a great weekend. Uh, be safe out there. Keep on fighting peacefully. Until Monday when we're back, my name is Jeff Santos, and it's now my time to say I gotta go.